So welcome everyone. I'm Cindy Myers from yourenergyhealer.com. And tonight we're going to be talking about preparing for the 4th of July. And you're like some of my pets, my dogs, they don't like 4th of July. It causes them some anxiety. As a matter of fact, I had a golden retriever and it really freaked her out. And it took me well, every year I kind of look for new tools to help her through it because the first few years she just shook and paced and panted and looked for a place to hide. And she just could, sometimes she barricaded herself in the bathroom, but she would just, it would take me hours to calm her down even after the fireworks stopped. And so I just kept looking for new tools to help her through it. I never could stop it fully, but by the end of her life, I had I had enough tools that I could pull her out of it within 10, 15 minutes, even with the fireworks going quite often. And she would lay down and go to sleep. So um, that's the good news is that we could do that for our pets. We got one more coming in, so we'll let her come on. So um, we're going to be talking a little bit more about how how that all works with our pets, with the fear, the anxiety, and then I'm going to give you the most important part is some tools that you can use in helping them through that. And and again, sometimes our our best outcome is if we can get them out of it faster. We may not be able to prevent the fear from kicking in you know, we're, it's reactionary. So we all get afraid at times. So this is a doozy when we hear, when they hear all those loud fireworks. And so we want to just support them as best we can and help them out of it as quickly as possible. So let me share my screen with the presentation I have. Here we go. And just um, unmute yourself if you have questions as I go, because I can't uh, see the chat when I share my screen very well. So. All right. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, before we get going, though, if you're having an emergency with your pet, please call your veterinarian. But what I can do for you in the emergency is provide energy support for them. And that he helps kick their natural healing abilities into gear. And it, and it can also, sometimes it takes us a while to get into a vet these days. So it just kind of buys you time to, before you get that support from your, from your vet. So that is something I can do for you. Um, and then with aggressive animals, if you have an aggression issue, I do insist that you work with a qualified trainer, especially one that specializes with aggression. It's just not enough to clear the trapped emotions. You need to help them learn a different way of handling a stressor. Okay, so let's look through the eyes of our pets and what they're experiencing when something scary is happening. So most of us tend to generalize. We, you know, we can step in a room and it's a room, it's a living room. You know, if you look at a house, it's got a kitchen. And, you know, it may be some nuances to it, but we can generalize pretty well. But our, to our pets, when you go into a new situation, a new room, a new place, even an old room, but if something changes in that environment, it's brand new and it's like, oh my goodness, I got, I need to learn this. So they don't generalize. They tend not to generalize. That's why in training, uh, when training with my dogs, if I teach him right now to, to um, sit or down or be in a certain, in our classroom, he does things great. You take him to a brand new setting. It's stepping back to square one in some ways to teach him how to do those same behaviors, those same skills in a new setting. It's different. And the goal is to eventually teach him to generalize more, but it's when you're working with animals, they know that this is to them, it's all different. So even teaching him to heal on my left side, it's totally different on my right side. That that is not the same to them. So, so kind of, we want to think through their perspective and how they see things. And, and so with 4th of July, and it's not just a normal day, there's a lot of different sounds. There might be more traffic. There might be, uh, 
just a whole lot of different things happening. Lots more barbecues. Remember their, their noses are a lot stronger than ours too. So they can be smelling stuff from all over the place of different things. So even if we are not hearing the fireworks very loud in our little area, you might be far enough away, they put off a scent. They put off a vibration and that is totally different. Even if they can't know, necessarily hear the loud sounds, they're feeling differences in their environment. <clears throat> and so that can, that can be enough to cause them to be anxious because something is different in their, even in their comfort of their own home. So how do they process emotions? How do our pets process? Well, when we're talking about the fear, it's just like us, any species, that's why they call it the reptilian <laughs> system that takes over, is that all species have that fight or flight response system. And, <clears throat> and so it, it's, in, it, it's designed to be turned on immediately. If there is a stressor of some sort, it turns on that fight or flight response system, the adrenaline kicks in, and they usually have several responses to that. Uh, they have several patterns of behavior that they tend to respond to when they are in that stress state, that fight or flight response state. They will run. They want to run the pacing. They want to look fireplace to hide. Uh, they may freeze. They might just stand still and not want to move at all. Or they get aggressive. They may want to fight. So for most of the folks that come into this webinar, you've probably seen the pacing, the panting, the the drooling, the the eyes really wide. They're not listening to you. If you ask them to do something, you're trying to get their attention, they can't hear you. They're not they can't, they can't access that kind of listening skill. They're listening to the threat and trying to figure out what is going on and how how do I get away from it. Um, <clears throat> So they may not, so they may not take food, treats. If, if you try, oh, I think I just got an orb again. <laughs> How about that? It's the second webinar I've done and had an orb show up. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> that's cool. Uh, so you could have, um, so they may not take food, like to give them treats. There it is again. All right. <laughs> uh, there may be, um, uh, you can't uh, distract them with toys. The normal distractions that you may be able to get them away from uh, a, a stress state aren't isn't working. And that's when they are in super uh, alert mode or hypersensitive to the 4th of July fireworks. So <clears throat> we want to help counter that. So the way to do that is by triggering the calming system, the parasympathetic response system. And so here's the tips. This is this is the 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 important stuff of this tonight's talk is the tips and the tools that you want to want to start sooner rather than later. That's why I wanted to do this as quickly as I could for you to prepare you for the fourth. Is you want to be able to create a Pavlovian sort of response. Cause again, they're in that fight or flight response system. They can't hear things, but we can start teaching them what the calming system means or how it works. We can start helping them turn that on. So breathing, believe it or not, <laughs> is one of your first important steps. Cause we tend to breathe more shallow and then we're worried about them being worried and they're picking up our worry. So they're going to see, there is something to be really afraid of because you're worried. I'm worried. So <clears throat> we want to breathe because that lowers our heart rate and, and pulse. So we want to take those slow, full, deep breaths in, even if we're a little anxious ourselves and upset that our pets are upset. We want to try and calm our own system down because we're little radars. And so if we get into a calmer system, we're going to be transmitting out that calming system, that breathing, that slow breath work. We are now quieting ourselves and transmitting it out to our pets and they're receiving it. It just isn't quite enough yet to counter the fear state, but that's just step one. Of course, we want to try and keep our pets inside 
we don't want them. This is the high time of them wanting to escape that run, that desire. And things that have normally keep them secure may not work. All of a sudden they figure out how to jump a big fence. They know how they get through something. So keep them inside. But as you're breathing slowly with your pet, I would like you to start petting them in a certain way. A very gentle petting, not massaging kind of petting, because that actually can trigger more of the adrenaline the petting and, and a little bit harder. That can be more exciting to them. It may feel good, but it it isn't the right system that we're trying to turn on in this situation. I want you to just do very light touches, very light. And you might actually want to look up a, a modality called T-Touch, and it's T-T-O-U-C-H, if you haven't heard of it before, you can um, Google or go to YouTube and find some simple videos on how to do it. But again, it's just a very light touch that you want to do. And that triggers that calming system. And where you, you know, I do it wherever my pet wants wants to receive it. But if I can get to, in this case, um, my, my golden retriever that was very petrified of fireworks and thunderstorms, she, when she realized that this is, this works for her, she would seek me out and she would back up to me. She wanted her, her rear end to receive mm -hmm. that T-touch. And that makes sense because that's where the root chakra is, which is their survival center. So she wanted her, her rear end right at the base of her tail done. And I would actually work her tail too. Okay, if dog has a tail, I would do those gentle touches up and down the tail, even move the tail. I would gently work to get that tail into a confident position. You know, when your dogs or your pets are scared, their tail tends to go underneath their legs. They're afraid. So by doing those gentle touches and working it gently, and creating it, getting it to raise up into a more confident position, it creates a paradox in their brain because animals use body language a lot to communicate. And so now they're, if their tail is up, they say, oh, my tail's up, but I'm afraid. That doesn't make sense. But you know what? My tail up and being confident feels better than being petrified. And they quite often will go to what feels better. So helping them get to that position using their body language that can help them come out of that fear state faster. And again, this is quite often our biggest goal is to get them out of it faster. So with my golden retriever, it in the beginning, it could take three, four hours to get her out of that fear state. By using some of these tools, I put her in a thunder shirt. I use some essential oils that were safe for dogs and cats. Um, I sometimes gave her calming chews and, and then I did these calming touches and but with using all these tools, I could get her out of it in 10, 15 minutes sometimes. And she would actually lay down and fall asleep behind me. And again, I didn't mind behind the couch or my chair. She liked those places because it's kind of den-like. So giving them a den-like place. Sometimes she would go in my closet if I had us in our my bedroom, which was one of the more secure places for Sam. Um, and that was fine. Any place that made her feel safe, I would let her go to. And she would usually fall asleep, even with the noise continuing on by using all those tools. And sometimes we have to use every single tool in our toolbox. Now with some minor fears, then the tea touches, the light touches were sometimes enough. But she would ask, she learned to know that I'm really afraid I need help. And she would come to me instead of the pacing, looking for a place. She knew, she learned after many times of doing these, these techniques with her, she knew I knew how to fix some of the things. And finally, the last thing that actually was like a big game changer in helping her through the fear state was using your words and choosing our words and, and actually clearing some of those trapped emotions, some of those emotions out of their system. And even if you're not an expert at energy work, you don't have to, you don't have to be, hear what they're communicating back. Just trust that this works. Just just do it. <laughs> Just do it. And what you're going to do is after you'd given them whatever uh, support you can with them, as I'm doing some of the calming touches, 
I will say, or if, if they're still pacing about and I can't, they're not ready to settle, I start repeating as a mantra, replace or clear fear. Re I say clear fear, clear fear, clear anxiety, any one of the, if they're anxious, but I just, you pretty much just, just say clear fear. And I recommend you do it in with your inside voice, not saying it out loud. If you say it out loud to help you get started, that's fine. But your pets will pick it up better. Again, we're radars and they don't, in this case, they're not going to hear your words. They'll, it'll be stronger if you just think it to them. But you're going to think to them, clear fear. And you might want to say that a few times over, clear fear, clear fear, clear fear. And now you're going to add in replace with peace and calm. I like to always replace it and tune them to that feel better emotion and frequency. So it's kind of like a, if you had a guitar and it was out of tune, you don't just, you need to, you need to refine it and tune it, right? If it's, if you had to put a new string in or just haven't used it in a few days, you've got to always tune it. Uh, and so if it's out of tune, you want to clear the fear first and then replace with peace and calm. And this one, I do like to use those frequency of peace and calm over other ones because they're really afraid. And that is the most powerful one to help them get into a calmer state. And that really works. <laughs> it really, really, it helps them get out of it faster. And because they hear it, that was when they start coming to you and asking for your support. Okay. So again, I'll want to breathe do the light touch light petting if they'll slow down enough if they can you get them to stop pacing and then uh, if you need to ahead of time give them any of the essential oils or the calming chews and you might need to get those from you always check with your vet ahead of time for any of those if you need to and uh, definitely make sure you get them from a place that is safe for pets because not oils not all oils are safe for pets. So please use companies that are specialized in pets. <clears throat> and then, uh, and then, so do your breathing, add in the slow touch, the gentle touches, work the tail, and then replay, clear fear, replace with peace and calm. Okay. Right. Let's, so. Now, a good chance that these pets get um, a lot of anxiety through these summer months and the 4th of July and maybe just our own stress of activities that we tend to pile in in June. Maybe you go on vacations or their, their routine gets shifted up. So they get a lot of trapped emotions. So I recommend my quick cleanse package. It's a 15 minute session. Um, and in the package, you get uh, several of these 15-minute phone calls with me, and I'll clear their trapped emotion, rebalance their energy, communicate with that pet, and help with improve any of behavioral physical issues that they may have. In, we got a lot of stuff happening in, in the next month or so. So um, uh, next, let's see, July 3rd, I'll be doing a, a healing circle for everybody that might want to enjoy it. Need some of that calming energy for yourself. This isn't for your pets. This is for you. And guess what? If we take care of ourselves and get ourselves in that calming place, it impacts your pets too. And then I have a course that I'm going to be teaching July 10th uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, and it's on the Claire. So it's on all the different types of intuition that you that we all have um, some of them are stronger than others so we'll be going over that and most of all we're going to I have a couple of, of exercises to practice with and have me guiding you through that so that's coming up July 10th and then I have a special event with Jen Weigel uh, Emmy Ward winning journalist uh, it's through her website and I'll, I'll include the links to all these in an email to you all that have signed up and then they're all on my website too. And our talk is going to be on the universal language of grief and all species grieve. And it's really interesting 
to watch how other species grieve. And then there's the emotion of grief for humans. There's not just the emotion of grief, but there is a process. Like we, we talked about the fight or flight response system. There's a system with grief as well. It's a very important system that was designed into us. Uh, and it's it is important if we use it for how it's designed, it can be incredibly powerful. So we want to understand that process as well as just as the emotion itself. So um, that is on July 15th and it's at 4 p.m. Pacific time. And then again, it is hosted by Jen Weigel. And then on the 17th, I'll be doing another healing circle. And then on uh, July 23rd, actually um, this month, next Tuesday, is going to be our first one is I'm starting a discussion group and for the it, all it, it it um the purpose and intent for this discussion group is to give people a safe place to talk about anything intuition anything spirit related uh dreams uh help you analyze your dreams uh, it's not going to be a class type setting. It's a discussion. Kind of bring your wine or your tea and sit down and let's talk about spirit. And Because a lot of times, I don't know if, if you guys are like me, but I'll sit, talk about something really cool that happened, like that orb or something, you know, that showed up twice today. <laughs> and tell somebody and they'll go, oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, no, it's really cool. <laughs> or, or spirit talks to me and, and I'll, I'll be all excited about it. Or I'm, I'm trying to figure out a, a dream and I'm kind of stuck. And, and I talk to friends and it just goes over with a thud. <laughs> so we need a group of people that are like-minded, that are curious and want to learn and talk about all this stuff. And, I, and I, so I decided to start this discussion group. So we have one this month and one next month scheduled. So we'll, we'll be doing that. Um, and the first one is complimentary. I just like you to all come in and we'll, you know, it'll evolve as you all participate and it'll morph to what you need. Um, so, uh, and then the end of the month, we'll finish off July with another healing circle. So, uh, all right, that's, that's what I have for the webinar. Any questions? You can unmute yourself. Um, yeah, I have a question. Could you repeat, please repeat um, what it was called? This touch. Oh, key touch. About? I'll put. I'll type it in the chat. Okay. T touch. Two T's. Okay. T okay, touch. Um, <clears throat> Linda Tellington Jones created the modality. Really powerful. Okay. Any other questions? The touch is, is more effective if they follow the top of the spine all the way down to the tail, too. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot. Uh, ears are really good if you can get into the ears because they'd have us all the acupressure points in the ears. So if they like their ears, both the ears, sometimes mm -hmm. the chest. But again, a lot of once they will, once you work, do some T touches with them and work down the spine and the head, the crown. The lips are also very calming if they let you, if they let you, not all animals like that, but some do. And um, it's very calming. My, uh, my puppy, she loves having her gums and lips done. She just got, <laughs> she falls asleep. It's adorable. <laughs> it's really helpful um, post-surgically. Yep. Keeps that energy. You, I do it on myself all the time. If I have an ache or a pain, I do the teeth pitches. I get a headache. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Lovely this? modality. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Wanna, is this the therapeutic touch? Um, or what does the T stand for? Um, Tellington touch. Oh, her okay. first name is mm, Telling. Her last name is Telling. Oh, okay. I can't do okay. Yeah, she's got a no number. Of books we can get um as well but do you just learn the really basic one I, she's got some great workshops highly recommend all of 
what she does. Um, okay. But uh, some of, I have her, a couple of her books and I look those up if I need a change, uh, if I feel like they need a different touch. But I use them with my alpacas. I use them with my cats. So there's the orb again. Is that Judy? What? <laughs> you know what? It's always on your right shoulder too. It is. <laughs> um, I wonder if it's I wonder if it's Tesla. Maybe. Maybe. That would be nice. Because you know, we're talking a lot about her. <laughs> and and she liked to help you. She did. She was really into the healing. And and she's the one that had the most anxiety in me. So was that your golden retriever, Tesla? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she, once she learned about the, not only the tea touches, but the clear, she really started coming to me more when I started doing the clear fear replace with peace and calm. And because mm -hmm. she knew that I could fix it for her. And so she would run to me and then she would turn around and have me do her rear end. <laughs> it's the root chakra. Yeah, the I had a golden also that would always back up into me and I never knew why. And now I do. Mm -hmm. So sometimes she starts, uh, she used to also love the healing circles. So she would put her rear end under my, usually my left hand, but not always, but most of the time. And, and so I do the butt. And then when she had enough of that, she would go to her head and she flip my hand to the top of her head to do the crown. <laughs> They're so smart. Yeah. They they know what they want and how they want it. <laughs> Kimmy, did you want me to work on your pet? Do you have are you up for it? Absolutely. Okay. Let me, you, you keep asking questions if you want to as we go, but I have your picture here. So who with you? Did you want both of them or one of them or? Well, you worked with Kahili, um. So, uh, that's okay. the. Cat. But Ruthie's kind of showing some, some anxieties right now. So, Ruthie. Uh, yeah. All right. Let's start with Ruthie. <laughs> so. Happen, Ruthie. So since she's having some anxiety, then it's a good thing to try and clear out before more is put in. So is this new? The anxiety, she's uh she's a COVID baby. And uh -huh. so she has um she has a lot of separation issues. Mm -hmm. And I've been traveling a ton. And so Okay. There's that. Mm -hmm. so let's clear some of the abandonment. And you're her forever person? I'd say that my partner is her forever person. Your partner. Is this the dog or the cat that you're working with? The, the, the beagle. Dog. The beagle. Okay. Let, let her know that she is with her forever person. Again, you know, you guys, they like their routine. And when that gets disrupted, <laughs> it pushes their buttons. And they don't like when you go away. No. Oh. My travels are pretty stressful, so. Well, and they're probably picking up that, too. Yeah. So, um, again, you can communicate with her when you go away and just tell her you're coming back to her. I like to use um, how many nighttime sleeps, unless it's a lot, but two, three, I'll be home in two, three, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. It, more than that, they tend, it's too long. Yeah, to my time. last one was 13, so. Yeah, so you just just reach out every day or a couple times a day, so I, I miss you too, and I'm coming home to you. Three more sunsets. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can do sunsets, you can do dawns. They're more driven by that. Don't use sleeps. Uh, if I say sleeps, it's nighttime sleeps or because you know how many naps they have during the day. So if you just say, right. <laughs> well, I had my nap. You should be here now. <laughs> <clears throat> so I want to use something more uh, lunar or solar driven. 
experience some more anxiety and and worry, lots of worry. Does um, Ruthie have a crate or where does she like to sleep? She sleeps with us. I would put like your, like a nightshirt or whatever you sleep in, in the bed. Okay. So he, it has your scent and then kind of like a transitional object, you know, it's okay. something that might help her. See if that doesn't help a little bit, but, but you're, you're there, but you're not there. I mean, it's not the same, but. The scent again, especially with a beagle whose nose, oh my goodness, right? her nose Absolutely. is so strong. Does, does she use her nose a lot? All the time. So I would keep her mind act busy, as busy as you guys can. And have do some nose work with her, you know, do puzzles. If you're not doing it, uh, have her look for stuff with her nose. Okay. Um. Is and especially when you're gone, but start it now with you know while you're here, and then, uh, and then keep that pattern going because that will help distract. Again, if she's in, it's true for us too. If we stay in our worry brain it we just obsess over that but if we can get it busy doing something more constructive and 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 follow her in, instincts which is do nose work that's her strong suit so yeah. uh i i would just do all sorts of you could look up again i i haven't trained any of my guys doing nose work other than some fun games with muffin tins and tennis balls and put a treat under the tennis ball and I have to figure out how to get to the tree um, or boxes or I do the mont what do they call that what the was it a monty game or something where you put the pee under yeah yeah things so you I, I use my cottage cheese tubs or <laughs> yogurt tubs mm -hmm. cleaned <laughs> and put the treat under one and then they and then mix it up and they have to find where where it is the ones that have really good noses it's not much of a challenge but anything that will challenge um and probably for her you could even I mean, get into that as a training thing yeah uh, and again anything like that if you can find a class or anything that works that brain in a constructive way and tire them out sniffing or just taking for a walk um sniffing is like 30 minutes of exercise five minutes oh, of sniff is is exhausting so letting them go out and sniff uh one one of the training techniques that i was really surprised that and it works really well for calming <laughs> And if in, in a highly distracted state um, is put the treat on the ground because they're using their nose and it's calming. Whether instead of giving it to them out of the hand, give it, put it on the ground so that they have to sniff. Oh, interesting. Okay. So yeah, my, sniffing my partner, is very calming. My partner takes her on long walks every single day. So yeah, it's not just... The actual walks that give yeah. them good sniff time. Yes. Uh, but the beagle requires it. Exactly. <laughs> the beagle <laughs> requires it. My partner it. will come home. She'll come home from the walk and say, okay, now I need to go for a walk for some exercise. So. Right. Right. And a lot yeah. of times we have to park that desire for the exercise. Right. Especially when, when you're out of town and she's more anxious, the sniffs should help. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on any of that? I don't I don't think so. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, have similar issues or concerns? Ideas? You're, you're welcome to pop in your ideas too. There's lots of geniuses, <laughs> more than me. Um, how about your cat? Anything we can do for her? Um. 
would help to clear her energy. I mean, she's been doing quite amazing since you worked with her. So, so tell the group what was going on with her that I helped her with, if you don't mind. I don't mind at all. She had um an idiopathic, uh, it was, she was peeing all over the place, like, and, and multiple times. And it was, um, It was really, it was a stress and behavior uh, situation that was going on. And we went through all of the process, like all of the the Western medical situation and nobody could find anything that was wrong with her except for her um, she, oh, polypoid cystitis. I, I couldn't remember it, but her bladder was incredibly inflamed and she just had to get anything out all the time. And she like peed on our bed like 20 times a night. And um, and what we really figured out is that uh, she is also a COVID baby and she um, was born in Canada and had to cross um, the border when the border was closed. And it, um, and she it was a pretty traumatic ride for her. She flew in a plane by herself and then um and then crossed the border in a in an animal transport van and she was in the front and everything and everything was fine but there was a stressful situation situation even though they were all like papered it was her and a couple of dogs and they were all all the documents were done but um the customs folks like stripped searched the van and took all of the pet supplies and everything and uh, and then a few months later, when the fires happened in Oregon, we were at risk and we had to um, evacuate. And there she was in a heightened state and went back in the crate and and we left. And, um, and I firmly believe that it has everything to do with the crate, the travel crate. Um, and she reacts to that. So she travels yeah. with a lot but mm -hmm. um we put her in the crate and then we get in the car and get settled and then she comes out okay so so yeah yeah for her the trigger is oh my goodness this is going to be another awful experience that's yeah that's how they they are triggered just kind of like us in that way regards but but they don't have the a language necessarily to understand why they're triggered they just know, oh my goodness, this is it. I'm getting transferred to a new home. Mm -hmm. So we cleared all that for her and she's doing so much better. So let's go in. The, when we when they tend to have a lot of trapped emotions, they can build up. So we don't want her to start peeing again. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Definitely don't want that. So, so let's clear. <laughs> So she remembered me. She went, oh hi. <laughs> really? That's a, that's amazing. But she does like want to release some some emotions, some worry. I'm I'm her person and so I've been gone a lot and and caregiving so, out of state. So okay. So let me explain to her why you have to leave more, that you have to go help somebody. She wants to know if she can go too. Oh, I would love for her to do that, but no. So right now, not now, but her job i like to give them jobs it's just to stay hold the fort down mm -hmm. and help with um ruthie ruthie needs her when you go away that is 100 percent true there's a nice shift so being able to explain that and then also to tell her that you always come home to her and that you miss her too But she keeps saying, I worry about you. I'm worried about you. Who's going to, who takes care of you? She says. Mm 
up telling her when you come home, you've got full duties to give you lots of fur therapy. <laughs> She said, sometimes I get mad. I get mad at her. Sorry, it is mad that you leave. <laughs> so. That makes sense. We're, her and I were very connected. It's a... So we'll release more of that abandonment because that's part of it. Oh, and we definitely want to release the peeved because that can build up and start the potting. So let's release that. And I'm going to clear her kidneys and bladder just for the heck of it because that's all related. Yeah, there we go. Right. Good. You're welcome. So she said, thank you. <laughs> I remember when you worked with her last time, she was um, like continuously apologetic for, for her behavior. And it was like, that just resonated with me about how sensitive and thoughtful she is. Mm -hmm. You know, they can't help it. It's not that we think we project sometimes that they're doing it intentionally. And they tend not to be, it's more they're trying to get our attention because we're not hearing something that they feel mm. that we should be getting. Right. And so, uh, we go, can't, you're not listening. How about if I do this? You, oh, you didn't hear me. Oh, okay. If I do this? No. Well, now I know what to do. I'm going to pee on your bed. Now do I have your attention? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, a lot. And then, you know, the, because I didn't really, I had no idea what was going on. And all of our um, vet care is up in Portland. And then I was putting her in the crate and we were traveling up there. And it was like, it was, we were just in this terrible cycle of what was happening. And once we kind of all figured it out and, like oh okay well this is done <laughs> so it, there were no more incidents after we cleared her i th i think maybe it was like it it quickly went away it wasn't like immediate but it was very clear what was going on so sometimes they do regress again trapped emotions it's, we all get emotion get trapped emotions every day it doesn't matter the species we pretty much get because we all have emotions. <laughs> and when That's you have true. a stressful uh, stuff happening at the home with you going away more, you know, that pushes their buttons, those trapped emotions can build up. And then we all are designed to be able to tolerate so many uh, trapped emotions. Our body can handle quite a bit. And then, but uh, if they keep building up, there's that threshold. And if we go get too many, then, then we we start seeing the physical and or behavioral issues rear up. And that's true for us too. It's, yeah. It's true for them. It's true for us. But it's just that sometimes, well, it's true for us too, where we don't, as a matter of fact, animals tend to let go of their trapped emotions easier than us two-leggers because we like to hang on to our baggage. <laughs> Whereas the animals go, oh, this makes me feel better. I'm happy. You take it. Go away. Make it. Make it. Oh, thank you. And so once they do have that experience, that's why she goes, oh, I remember you, is because they do remember who, they don't necessarily know I'm a human, but they know that my energy helped them before. And so they'll recognize it. And sometimes once, if I've worked with them, <laughs> sometimes I'll, I'll go, they reach out to me and say, I need help. <laughs> so if I reach out to somebody because they, <laughs> so-and-so just said, I need your help. <laughs> <clears throat> that happened um just recently i actually it's one of the first times uh i had not worked with this dog yet but i was talking to the person about their dog ahead of time and this dog just piped in and started communicating with me and i, said, I think amazing. i can really help your dog because <laughs> yeah. it too is was having accidents in its crate all the time and on it which is unusual in a crate 
because they don't mm -hmm. want to go potty. But anything plush on the bed, on you know, any soft surface, it was having these terrible accidents all the time. And so, uh, but had a really rough start in life. It was, had been, this was her, his fifth home. Oh. And so it was like, oh, I think I can, I know I can help this dog. <laughs> And this, yeah. uh, and it was like, please help me, please help me. I mean, it was reaching out to me just in the conversation with the person about what I do and how I may be able to help them. And so they said, yeah, I'll make an appointment. And I didn't hear from them for quite a few days. And the dog reached out to me one night in the middle of the night, like two or three in the morning. So I'd, Would you please help me? <laughs> and I said, All right, I'll, I'll contact your person <laughs> tomorrow and see if I can help prod the appointment. And, and it gave me clues of what was wrong in, as I was waking up. <laughs> I was going, gosh, I hope I remember it. But that was one of the first times that without me not doing the actual work on the, on an animal, but they do reach out to me after I work on them. So. That's and, pretty and, nice. and, and, and guess what? They stopped peeing <laughs> after I did Of course, well, that doesn't surprise <laughs> <me> at all. <laughs> they have not had any pee accidents since I worked with them. <laughs> <So>. <clears throat> And those were trapped emotions from all that trauma. And in this case, that also had a birth trauma. Birth trauma was also oh, involved, geez. which the dog communicated to me early on uh, or, or when they woke me up. I went, oh, I think this is birth trauma. Okay, I got to remember this. So when I communicate with, communicate with your person, <laughs> I can, I got to remember this so I can clear that point. Any any other questions? Thank you for sharing your pets. Thank thank you. No, it was just it's kind of nice having a small intimate group today. I I have a, I don't want to own this conversation by any means, but if nobody else is asking a question, I've been doing a lot of um in between my caregiving, I've been doing a lot of uh volunteer work for the Beagle Freedom Project, who mm -hmm. is trying to rid the world of animal testing. And I am, I transport um, them, their, the animals that they've rescued. And I also go to their facility in Oklahoma and help them. They just um, closed down the laboratory. And so they're in the process of uh, shifting it from a laboratory to a sanctuary and an adoption center and a rehab place. So it's like this really beautiful situation that's happening. Do you have any... Um, tips on like what I can do because these dogs have been and cats and and pigs they've been tortured their entire lives and and now they're being set free so yeah that it it kind of goes with what I talked about earlier in the webinar that these new experiences can be really overwhelming mm-hmm and so you know, a lot of them have never been outside, never been in grass, never seen, you know, been in a home life. So, so lots of trapped of, emotions them, to try and them, help them. them. Yeah. Uh, I have worked with a couple of animals that had that kind of a start in life. And it it's taken a lot of work, a lot of patience and a lot of teamwork in helping them get readjusted as best we can. It hasn't fixed everything for some. Some may adjust quite mm -hmm. nicely. It really depends on their personalities to some degree, but it, just think it's going to be incredibly overwhelming. The one dog that um, that I did work, that I, I still work with actually, um, still has quite a bit of anxiety uh, attachment issues. This is a big issue for them. I'm sure. But they weren't like they didn't like to be touched they didn't like to be petted they didn't like nothing <laughs> they, they, they wanted to they be in like their human. freight because that's yeah. what they knew that was their safe mm -hmm. place and so the person had to actually almost crawl into the crate do those light touches until they started feeling safe about being touched uh the kitchen scared the crap out of them took us multiple sessions before i understood what was what it was about the kitchen and it was like they they didn't recognize that the person was opening the drawers and closing it they just thought spirits weird things ghosts you know 
things were magically moving and flying through the air. Something dropped. Oh my gosh, that was like petrifying. They wouldn't eat or drink in the kitchen until everybody left and, and were asleep at night sometimes because movement in the kitchen, anything, again, drawers, cupboards, anything, cooking, they didn't know what any of that meant. And so that was just incredibly frightening when I communicated to them just to sit and that it's the person doing those things that, that, that cured them of that fear of being in the kitchen and get, go get drink of water in the kitchen and well, that's amazing. Uh, eat. But everything was just trying to slowly introduce, okay, let's try this with the person. Let's try this. And finally mm -hmm. now, oh my gosh, the dog begs. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, people said that knew the dog from the beginning when they first got it to where it is now, as they said, Oh my God, it's like a real dog now because that's before. so cool. Yeah, so that's, if that's the like extreme, that was an extreme, yeah. but it took a lot of dedicated time and effort on the, and expense on the person's part. I'm sure. to get, um, and they did Reiki, they did massage, they did chiropractor, they do me to help that little doggy. Yeah, I like I climb in the crates that they're in now, and I just sit with them. I I don't even like you know I'll do a little bit of light touch, but I just sit with them and just let them know that it's just okay. That yeah, you do energy, <laughs> so breathing, release fear, replace okay. with peace and calm. If they don't want to be touched, you can do that. My alpacas don't like to be touched most of the time, so I do it at a distance. They get it. Okay, I do all my sessions over the phone. They get it. Um, so, but that's your basic technique. If they won't, don't want to get touched, release fear, replace peace and calm, breathe. Okay. And then, then you can try and get them. So sometimes I would use the back of my hand instead of, because when oh. they get pulled out of the crate, right. guess what? they're being grabbed with this, yeah. but I can't grab them with the back of my hand. So you can start doing the touches with the back of your hand. I'll do that with my alpacas. I okay. do the back of the hand with them sometimes. <clears throat> and that is feels safer for them. Then they, they know the difference. Yeah. Well, because you can't. Can't grab them. Yeah. So it has a different energy to it. Um, I'm just trying to think what else. So, yeah, I would try and work and get those touches. And then a slow introduction to everything. And just remember that everything you know if you bring them into a room it's sensory overload yeah it's the first time ever I've so had... a lot of deep time for decompressing mm -hmm. patience patience i probably my latest puppy um she was found in a dumpster transported you know was spent for four weeks in a shelter then transported up to oregon four weeks in another shelter only new pens and crates other than the dumpster, I think. Who knows what she had beforehand, but don't believe she'd ever been in grass just from her behavior. The first time she went in grass, she was just like, she kept, she still mouths it a lot. Like, but now, I mean, but at first she was just like, she was afraid of the first little grass area that I put her in on our, on our drive home. She wouldn't do anything. But when she came home, yeah. she fascinated by the grass. <laughs> So it's really it. it's so powerful to like to experience that and to be there i had this it was a nine-year-old beagle and he had never been outside of the laboratory in his entire life and uh and now i was transporting him from oklahoma to phoenix arizona where his foster was and um we stayed overnight in albuquerque and we walked around to different and it was just he and I at this point, I had somebody else walking the other ones that I was transporting and, um, and it was he and I, and we walked to the grass and he like, like was timid on the grass, but kind of smelled and, and like poked around and everything. And then he gave me this, he jumped up and gave me this big hug. Aww. And then we walked over to a bush and he did the same thing, timid around it, smelled it, kind of looked around, figured it out ran over, you know, he, he was on leash and then he gave me a big hug. And every single time we went to a different thing that was in this parking lot, he would experience it and then come and give me a big hug. And I'm like, he knows exactly what's going on. 
And it was just, I'm like, I am sold on this process. <laughs> good, good. Keep on doing it for sure. Yeah, yeah. That's a special thing to get these dogs to uh, have a better life. Yeah. And cats and pigs, any animal that deserves better than that. Anything yeah. else? Thank you for sharing that story. Thank you. I think yeah. I it was in the news a while back about it, the Beagles getting. Uh, that's them. Okay. It was on um, NBC uh, nightly news last week, and it was on. Um, it's it's been on the news. It's a major. It was a major thing. They've they've shut it. They shut down a whole laboratory, and that's great they, because I don't think it had been shut down the a few years ago when I first heard it. I don't remember who it was or what it was. Well, there's now. over 67,000 beagles that are locked up in the United States today being tested on. So there's laboratories all over the place. <laughs> Sad. Yeah. Well, bless you for doing that work. Well, of course. And let me know if I can be of help to any of them. I appreciate that. Thank you. Anything else, anybody? I'm going to stop the recording here.